let's take a look at one of the most unique and forgotten aircraft designs ever to fly, and which ended up being the last Sabre, the F-107 Ultra Sabre. Easily one of the most unusual jet fighters to ever fly, the F-107 was North American Aviation's entry into the U.S. Air Force's tactical fighter-bomber design competition of the mid-1950s. During the early years of the Cold War, the Air Force wanted a tactical fighter that could fly at Mach 2 and carry either conventional or nuclear payloads. This was deemed critical to national defense, which led to the competition. The North American Aviation design entry was based on the hugely successful F-100 Super Sabre. However, the F-107 included many radical design features, especially the over-the-fuselage air intakes. Because of its basis on the F-100, the F-107 was informally referred to as the Ultra Sabre, while those who worked on it and flew it referred to it as the Man Eater, given the unusual location of the air intakes. Despite its ungainly appearance, the Ultra Sabre had excellent performance for its time. It also packed a serious punch as the F-107 was equipped with four Pontiac M39 20mm cannons in the fuselage. North American Aviation pulled out all the stops when designing this radical airframe along with some ingenious testing methods for its generation. It's hard to imagine now, but there was a time when North American Aviation was the premier fighter manufacturer in the world. This, after all, was the company that produced the war-winning P-51 Mustang and followed that up with the F-86 Sabre, which minted many jet aces in the Korean War while dogfighting in MiG Alley. Following the Sabre, North American went on to produce the F-100 Super Sabre, which was America's first jet fighter capable of level supersonic flight. Interestingly, the F-107 actually began its life as a variant of the F-100 and was initially designated the F-100B. However, as requirements and design features changed, the aircraft was given the all-new designation F-107. One of the key design changes made to the F-107 and what led to its unique appearance was the position of the air intakes. This was due to the fact that the F-107 needed to attain high speeds while carrying a large payload for a fighter. The solution was simple, create a semi-recessed centerline hardpoint which had reduced impact on the airflow. However, the fuselage area taken up for this design decision took up considerable room, and as a result, the nose-mounted air intake found on the F-100 was removed, causing the air intakes to be positioned above the fuselage. Aside from being in an unconventional position, these air intakes made the first ever use of a variable area inlet duct or VADE design, which controlled the amount of air let into the engine. The VADE system proved to be extremely efficient and was used on other North American designs such as the XB-70 Valkyrie, the XF-108 Rapier, and the A-5 Vigilante. And while the location of the F-107's intakes essentially eliminated rearward visibility for the pilot, this was deemed acceptable given the aircraft's intended role as a tactical fighter-bomber, along with the prevailing missile theory of the 1950s, which viewed dogfighting as obsolete. Before we get into the ejection system, today's video is brought to you by Endel. Whether you're designing ejection seats or just working on a fun project, Endel is an app that creates personalized soundscapes to give your mind and body what it needs to achieve total immersion in any task. The app uses patented AI technology to help you focus, relax, and even sleep. I don't need to tell you that we live in an increasingly distracting world, which affects us mentally and physically every day. Endo takes its cues from neuroscience and generates soothing soundscapes that realign your current state with the circadian rhythm. This improves concentration and boosts your productivity while reducing your stress levels and relieving brain fatigue. The app uses various inputs such as local time of day, weather, and even heart rate to create soundscapes which adapt to your actual needs, producing a unique, endless sound that is generated in real time. What you are hearing is the actual soundscape I was listening to while editing this video. Additionally, you also get access to Endow's collaboration with James Blake, who produced an excellent wind-down soundscape to help you sleep. It's absolutely relaxing. The first 100 people to download Endo and use my promo code We'll get a free week of audio experiences. Try it today. And now, let's take a look at the F-107's ejection system. Given the potentially dangerous location of the air intakes to the pilot, canopy and ejection systems were thoroughly tested. 
The canopy itself was a one-piece design, which was driven by a chain on vertical tracks that opened upward as opposed to sliding back or on a hinge like most fighters. North American engineers used a crash test dummy nicknamed George to perform their tests. To thoroughly study and record the ejection process, high-speed cameras were used, which required increased lighting in order to film properly. The first test was to demonstrate how the canopy would separate from the fuselage safely. The second test conducted involved ejecting George the dummy out of the aircraft. To do this, engineers positioned the aircraft at an 18 degree angle, which was calculated to have the dummy land on a net that was positioned behind the aircraft. Fortunately, as predicted, George was ejected safely and landed on the net. Keep in mind, this is the mid-1950s. Ejection seats of any kind were new technology that was in its infancy. The challenges posed by the air intakes only complicated matters. Despite this, tests showed that the ejection system was indeed safe for the pilot. One more interesting fact about the ejection system. Ultimately, it was designed so that the pilot would have to blast right through the canopy. Fortunately, this was never necessary by the test pilots who flew the F-107. Another innovative feature of the F-107 was the all-movable vertical tail. Instead of a rudder, the entire tail section could be rotated. Along with this, the F-107 could use spoilers to roll the aircraft at high speeds instead of using ailerons. This was made possible by the ALCS or Augmented Longitudinal Control System. Augmented is the key here. The system has a built-in pitch damper and also uses electronic systems to provide the pilot enhanced control. This was incredibly advanced for the mid-1950s and can be thought of as an early version of fly-by-wire implementation. An often overlooked feature of the F-107 is forward retracting landing gear. Both the main wheels and the nose wheel retract forward. Similar to the ejection system, this was thoroughly tested. To simulate loads placed on the landing gear while it was deployed at speed, rubber shock cords were used. A winch then took up the slack and the gear was raised under tension. The same was done with the landing gear deployment under tension. To test the landing gear doors, vacuum cuffs were placed over the panels and attempted to force the doors open. The aircraft's hydraulic systems were stress tested to ensure the landing gear doors would remain closed during flight. Flight controls were also stress tested by using hydraulic actuators that would move the control inputs to their extremes. Maximum pilot forces required for full control input were simulated and measured. The test showed that the range of motion was adequate for full control deflection. The engine used on the F-107 was a Pratt & Whitney YJ-75 P9 turbojet, which generated up to 24,500 pounds of thrust and could be removed by way of four bolts. Given the high speeds the F-107 was expected to fly at, specialized sensors such as vibration pickups were used like a stethoscope to help detect where unwanted oscillations might occur in the airframe, which could lead to structural failure. The entire airframe was scoped in this way to ensure that no areas produced uncontrolled oscillations. Once all of the ground testing was completed, the F-107 was wrapped in hundreds of miles of corrugated paper and trucked from Los Angeles to Edwards Air Force Base for flight testing. Imagine driving on a California highway in the 1950s and seeing this motorcade go by. In order to gather accurate data from flight tests, taking advantage of the F-107's recessed central bay, a specially designed instrumentation pod was designed and used. This was long before microelectronics, and sensor equipment was much larger and heavier than today. The weapons bay made extensive data gathering possible. Flight telemetry was also relayed to ground station via radio transmitters. Prior to the first flight of the F-107, all systems were rechecked on the ground, including an engine run-up which consisted of full afterburner operation. Following this final test, the F-107 was deemed ready for its first flight, with North American Chief Test Pilot Bob Baker at the controls. Mr. Baker proceeded to check the horizontal stabilizers, then the spoilers, tail and flaps. Finally, electrical power was removed along with the wheel chocks. The F-107 was ready to fly into history. Interestingly, a TF-100 was used as a chase plane during the first flight. You can see some of the similarities between the two airframes as they fly together. On September 10, 1956, the Ultra Sabre joined an exclusive club by breaking the sound barrier on its maiden flight. For the Air Force's tactical fighter-bomber competition of the 1950s, North American's F-107 went up against Republic's F-105. 
During the build-up to the competition, North America rightly had high hopes for the Ultra Sabre, given its previous successes in fighter design up to that point. Optimism was so high that there were even talks about subcontracting production to Republic once the F-107 was chosen. However, perhaps because of the F-107's rigorous testing schedule, the Republic F-105 was ordered into production in March of 1956, some six months prior to the F-107's maiden flight. The decision to choose the F-105 has been debated ever since by aviation historians. After all, the F-107 using the same J-75 engine as the F-105 demonstrated a superior rate of climb, higher ceiling, and incorporated the advanced features discussed previously. So why did the F-105 win out? For starters, the Air Force preferred the F-105's internal bomb bay and its increased ordnance carrying capacity of 4,000 pounds as compared to the faster F-107. Additionally, many speculate that North American already had too many projects underway, such as the Mach 3 XB-70 Valkyrie bomber, the carrier-based nuclear bomber A-5 Vigilante, and the XF-108 Rapier, a Mach 3 interceptor. Meanwhile, Republic was winding down production of the F-84 series of fighters and had no other future projects at the time. Some speculate that Republic was given the contract to keep its assembly lines running. Ironically, of the North American projects that were in development, only the A-5 ever made it into production. Today, not many people know about or remember the North American F-107, which ultimately became the last version of the wildly successful Sabre fighter family. At the end of the day, the F-107 Ultra Sabre may simply have been too advanced for its time. However, the F-107 did have lasting contributions to aviation. The variable area inlet duct systems pioneered by the F-107 is widely considered the forerunner of variable intake ramps and is common in modern fighter plane design, something that today's F-15 Eagle has used to great effect. The winner in the F-107's competition, the F-105 Thunder Chief or THUD as it became known, was a good airplane and saw extensive use in Vietnam. Still, one has to wonder what could have been had the F-107 gone into production. Would North American aviation still be in the fighter plane business today? Sadly, the F-107 was the end of the line for the Sabre family, the last Sabre.